Um, it's an honor to serve as moderator for this panel, discussing ISR's role in the past, present, and future of research on economic inequality. Since the first years of ISR's existence, ISR's researchers have been pioneers in the collection of data on economic behavior that has been the bedrock for much of our understanding of the dynamics of economic inequality. From 1946 to 1971, the Survey Research Center, in conjunction with the Federal, Federal Reserve Board, conducted the Survey of Consumer Finances, which provided some of the first in information on the distribution of income and wealth in the United States. In 1968, SRC initiated the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, which has led to great increases in our understandings of the causes of transitions into and out of poverty, the intergenerational transmission of socioeconomic status, and the relationship between socioeconomic status and health across the life course. The Population Study Center, which joined ISR in 1998, has trained generations of scholars that have gone to push, on, to push forward knowledge about the links between demographic phenomena and economic inequality. And ICPSR, the world's largest social science data repository, has facilitated research on economic inequality by allowing scholars around the world to store, share, access, and analyze socioeconomic data in a central archive. Our speakers today are uniquely well positioned to discuss the role that ISR has played in shaping research on economic inequality, as well as the directions that ISR can take in the future to remain at the forefront of this research. First, we will hear from Fabian Pfeffer, who is professor of sociology at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich, I hope I got that right, <laughs> where he holds the chair for social inequality and social structures and is the founding director of the Munich International Stone Center for Inequality Research. Fabian has been internationally recognized for his pioneering work in the fields of social inequality and mobility, particularly in the domains of wealth and education. Before moving to Munich, Fabian spent 13 years at the Institute for Social Research, working as a professor in the Survey Research Center a co-investigator on the panel study for income dynamics and founding director of the Stone Center for in Inequality Dynamics. Today, Fabian will encourage us to invest in the tools to share research findings on economic inequality with the broader public and to spend time seriously considering what a more egalitarian society could look like and also allowing our research to be shaped by visions of real utopias. Next, we will hear from Sasha Killewald, who is a Robert F. Shaney Research Professor at the Institute for Social Research, the current director of the Stone Center for Inequality Dynamics, a professor in the Department of Sociology, and a recent electee to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Sasha is one of the leading sociologists studying the intersection between work and the family, unpacking how demographic processes like marriage, parenthood, and divorce are associated with different economic returns for men and for women. She has also advanced a state of knowledge on the role of the intergenerational transmission of wealth and maintaining racial wealth disparities. In addition to her current position, Sasha also received her PhD in public policy and sociology from the University of Michigan and was a research fellow in the Population Studies Center while a graduate student here. Sasha will talk today about ISR's past and future role in creating the data pro products necessary to study economic inequality and in training the, and nurturing the next generation of inequality scholars. After Fabian and Sasha present, I'll kick off a Q&A session with a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to all of you. Uh, when it comes time, please line up behind the microphone stand in the uh, aisle uh, to ask your questions if you're able. If not, I'm also happy to take a microphone to your seat. Uh, with that said, let's please give Fabian and Sasha a warm ISR round of applause. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome, thank you for attending, and what a privilege to be here. Uh, it's been a privilege to be here for 13 years, and it's a pleasure to be back anytime you have me. Um, and thank you for the generous introduction, Joe. So uh, we're celebrating 75 years of social science in the public interest, and since that seems to generate people to reminisce, uh, I also started reminiscing as I prepared for this talk. I don't have 60 years to look back on, but I went to as early as I could think of in my own academic career. So I'll start with an initial personal reflection. Um, my father worked as a staff uh, in the German version of the Gallup Institute. Uh, he was an incredibly 
well-rounded scholar without any formal education. He knew a lot of stuff and he was surrounded by all these uh, academics and was surprised by that they didn't know more than him. So he, over time, he developed quite a hate, especially for sociologists. <laughs> so when I told him I would become a sociologist or I'm considering studying sociology, uh, sociology the first thing he did is he uh, gave me a book. And some of you may uh, know this book. It's called The Unemployed of Marienthal, written by three Austrian sociologists, Marie Jahoda, uh, Paul Lazarsfeld, which some of you will know, and um, Hans Seisel. Uh, arguably, it's one of the earliest uh, works of social research and survey research. Basically, these people had the idea of moving into a community that had just lost its main employer. 2,000 people became unemployed from one day to the next, and they started studying what happens to them. It's really sort of one piece of, you know, it's similar to the American soldiers, these early waves of empirical research. So he had the good sense of giving me this, but not without comment. Of course, he wrote some dedication. This is the dedication uh, by my father in 2001 as I was going off to college, and I'll translate the most important part. He gave me this as a constant warning. Sociology should be in the service to people. How close to the mission of ISR? Um, so I can also say that once I joined ISR, he came around to being okay with me, being a sociologist. So ISR has provided deep meaning to me uh, on many fronts. So 75 years of social science in the public interest is easy to celebrate because it's so clear that ISR has built infrastructures that have served the public interest. And Joe already mentioned too, just picking out from many, the sort of consumers, even before the official uh, founding of ISR, Panel of Study of Income Dynamics, uh, Sasha will give you a love letter to PSID. Um, and to me, it's just quite obvious how creating knowledge about the economic well-being of your population is important for your nation. And thus, it's sort of obvious that's in the public interest. What I want to push us to do is to think a little further and say, is that creation of knowledge, especially through data, really sufficient today? And I have two hypotheses. One is, we need to work a little harder to make that knowledge accessible. So I'll talk about accessible description in the first part of my talk, and then talk about how ISR can, is, and should contribute to it. In the second part, I say that we need to go beyond even creating accessible knowledge and bring our own scientific methods to study questions of not just what is, but also what could be. So we need to go beyond description. Those are the two contributions I wanna make, and again, ask ourselves what's ISR's unique role in catering to both of these. Uh, if we do that right, perhaps it's also social science for the public interest. It is, it will resonate with the broader public and I think that should be one of our goals. So what do I mean by accessible description? I'll give you a few examples today and they all come basically from one variable. I'm a simple kind of person, uh, wealth, net worth. And for those people in the room, there are a lot, for example, PSID, uh, data editors here, they know how hard it is to get to that one variable, right? Uh, lots of blood and sweat that goes into it. And what I'm doing today is I grab that one variable and try to make it accessible to a broader public. Um, so what you're gonna see is information based on ISR products, or at least ISR initiated surveys. The Survey of Consumer Finance that started here is now run by the Federal Reserve and the PSID and done by ISR researchers and collaborators. Ashut Virjarasi is in the, in the room as a graduate uh, student. Sasha makes an appearance. Kathy Valikov is an architect here at the University of Michigan, also illustrating the interdisciplinary nature. So let's talk about wealth inequality. So I can give you just the facts, ma'am, right? So here are the facts. The top 1% holds 40% of all wealth. The bottom 50% hold about 2.5%. Median wealth of black households is about 10 to 15% of white households. All staggering and perhaps shocking numbers, and to an educated public like the one today, perhaps immediately legible. Uh, nevertheless, as I engage, have engaged in this work on wealth inequality for many years, I realize at some point that it's, I still don't have a good intuition what that actually means. I still couldn't sort of imagine what wealth inequality really looks like in this country. So let me present three ways in which we try to make that more legible. Um, and you can, they're all online, you can try yourself. One certainly is the one that we did up with Asher 
um, that allows you to play around with, um, as I find it here, and now I need to do that trick of moving my cursor. We tried this, okay. So this is the distribution of net worth, of wealth, everything you owe, own, like financial assets, real assets, minus everything you owe, that's student debt, for example. When you put that together, you have net worth, and the question is, um, how much wealth you need at each step of the distribution? These are percentiles, so for example, the 50th here is the median. How much wealth do you need if you want to be in the middle of the distribution in the United States? Now, of course, the first impression that you get, it's quite unequal, right? It's a very heavy right tail. In fact, you may get the impression that there's no wealth to be had at the bottom of the distribution. I just told you it's only two and a half percent. But what you could do um, if you're in the bottom half, which most of us really are, you could zoom in and could learn more about the distribution. You could see that more than 10% of the American population is in net debt, owing more that they own. And that there's actually substantial wealth throughout the distribution still. Another thing you could do is you could ask yourself, well, certainly I'm a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. How much more do I need until I'm in the top 1%? The answer is about $11 million in 2019. Um, and that's quite a lot. Um, and still, what we're missing here, since we do use survey data, are the really wealthy. So this is just the top 1%. So one other thing we did is we asked ourselves, what would it take to be on the Forbes 400, the uh, wealthiest 400 people in this country? And let me show you. We'll just uh, put them here and rescale. This is what it takes to be in the Forbes 400, right? Poor, and, poor 1%. So this scale is something that's just sort of hard to wrap your head around. And I think Asher worked really hard on, on making that happen. And I think it did something. We did something else. Um, and I'll show you how else we tried to illustrate that. This is a video. I'll show you the first three and a half minutes. And then I'll show you the last three and a half minutes at the end. Student debt and mortgage tuition. If you're left with, say, just one dollar, you're certainly not well, but you also have more wealth than about 10% of the U.S. population. One in two U.S. households have either no wealth at all or are in debt. But what about those with wealth? Just how much do they have? Let's begin by looking at those who have managed to accumulate some wealth, even if not a lot. Here's a stack of about $12,001. wealth was about how much you would need in 2019 to have more wealth than a quarter of U.S. households did. Not far away from that, with about $20,000 of wealth, we have the average black household. Research has shown that black wealth has been kept much lower than that of other groups for many decades now. In fact, it is a full $100,000 lower than the midpoint of the U.S. wealth distribution. With $121,000, you would be right in the middle of the wealth structure and be doing better than about half of the U.S. population. So let's keep going to see how the upper half is doing. Here is the average white family. It holds nearly nine times as much wealth as the average black family, whose wealth level you saw just a few seconds ago. It takes quite a bit more to move towards the top of the wealth structure. In fact, many more dollar coins than the height of the World Trade Center. For instance, to make it into the top quarter of the wealth structure, that is, to have a higher level of wealth than the bottom 75% of the population, you need at least $400,000. To be part of the wealthiest 10% already takes more than a million. The wealth of the top 10% has grown substantially over the last decade, but most of the growth actually occurred at the tippy top of that group among the wealthiest 1%. To be part of that wealthy group, you'll need more than $11 million. That's a lot, and still far, far away from some of the wealthiest people in the country. 
Forbes magazine publishes a list of the 400 wealthiest individuals each year. To make it onto that list, you'd need not millions, but billions of dollars. Our stack of $1 coins now already reaches heights far beyond the International Space Station. At the top of the list is Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. Forbes estimated his total wealth at $115 billion in 2019. Two years after that, during the first years of the COVID pandemic, Jeff Bezos' wealth grew by another 60%. We'd be running out of dollar coins, but the stack would just about reach the moon. By 2022, Jeff Bezos was not even the wealthiest U.S. American anymore. That would be Elon Musk, with a level of wealth far beyond the moon. <laughs> wealth inequality in the U.S. is nothing short of astronomical, and a lot of wealth is concentrated at the very, very top. Is there such thing as too much wealth? Okay. Um, so here is my claim. Uh, ISR can do this and can help us support can help support us to create these kinds of accessible uh, visualizations. I at least hope they're accessible. Um, why should it? First, it's easy, at least compared to what we normally do, namely all the hard work that the people in the room did in creating that one variable, right? This is easy. Um, for example, you just hire data journalists. These are people who are specialized in doing just that. Uh, second, also, uh, same reason, it's very cheap. If you think about how much we invest in collecting these data, this is, these are the last 10 yards of a long marathon that begins with grant writing, collecting data, preparing data. And it's a tiny uh, amount of money we could invest in making it accessible ourselves. Now you can say, well, but we have the New York Times. They can do this too. And I say, it's important that we do that. And why is that? In the same way that data collection profits from scientific expertise, and this is the history of ISR, data visualization or making descriptive statistics accessible also profits from scientific knowledge. And partly because we also wanna provide the right narrative. And this is what we give up. When we rely on the New York Times to illustrate our data, we're giving up control of the narrative. And why is that important? Let me show you the last visualization that Sasha and I put together a few years ago. And that uh, deals with the question of intergenerational wealth mobility. So this is based on the panel study of income dynamics. What you see are children who grow up in the middle 20% of the wealth distribution, middle quintile. And the question is, where do they end up as adults um, in, their ter in terms of their own wealth? Do they stay in the middle? Do they fall down? Do they move up? You see that we distinguish uh, black and white children, here signified by blue and uh, orange dots respectively. And what you already see by now is that there is a tendency to towards much greater downward intergenerational wealth mobility. So black children who grow up in the middle of the wealth distribution are more likely to fall down as adults as white children. Now this is interactive too, you could play around with this, you could say let's start somewhere else, let's start at the top, you see the same pattern, but this is actually not a great place, this is not a great way to look at it, partly if you know what the wealth distribution across racial groups is in the US, this is a more natural way to look at it. We're scaling by population representation, you see that most black children in the United States grow up in the bottom 40% of the distribution. The question again is, where do they end up? And you see there is movement. Certainly not everyone stays in the same position. There's ample intergenerational movement, but if you look at their position in their adult generation, not a whole lot has changed. In fact, this has the right height. If I put myself in front of this, you would think nothing has changed. Very sociological kind of insight. While there's individual level fluctuation, structurally we're reproducing the racialized wealth structure. So why is that important that we discuss that because we can provide a narrative why that is. To me, what you see here is the long arm of history of direct racial exclusion and exploitation. And here you see continued forms of institutional racism. Other narratives could be provided and we can come back to that. But when we publish these things, we can provide these narratives that go along. 
Do we have direct evidence in our study that we did of institutional racism? We don't. But Sasha and I, I think, have read enough and formed our opinion that we're pretty confident about providing that narrative of institutional racism as opposed to individualist explanation. OK, second half, I'm in time. OK, as if this wasn't hard enough, uh, I'm saying we need to go way beyond that kind of description. Um, and part of that comes from teaching. Uh, you teach a class on inequality, and about halfway through, the students say, not in these exact terms, but they say, OK, we get it. Everything's terrible. Tell us, you know, tell us something good. Um, and I do think that reflects actually a, a claim of society, a claim that, or an expectation that society increasingly has for us, which is to do more than explain, uh, describing and explaining inequality, and to also provide a vision of how it could be different, uh, or more specifically, of a more equal future. There are many frameworks to approach that. One that I like actually comes from uh, Eric Olin Wright. Here's another ISR connection, uh, uh, son-in-law of Bob Kahn. Uh, visited Michigan often, uh, but of course was a, a famous sociologist, president of the American Sociological Association, and had this intellectual project on real utopias. Now, real utopias is already a contradiction. What did he mean? He said, as social scientists, we also need to define a vision of an emancipatory, more democratic future, irrespective of political feasibility, or the current uh, political discourse. So that's the utopian part. We need to define a vision. And then, and only then, we need to bring our standard social scientific tools to assess that vision and what it applies for a future state. And that sequence, sort of the, you know, testing the utopia for the real is what we should engage in. And it turns out, as I'll come back in a second, that we can really use our standard scientific tools to do that. So, how could we do that? Uh, it's not really delivering on what Eric Olin Wright asked us to do, but I will show you the second part of um, the visualization that you just saw. Uh, not claiming that it fully delivers on the real utopia, but probably to illustrate that we could think about an utopian state and bring some numbers to it. What if we decided there was? What if we drew a line at the top? a level above which we decide that no individual should continue to amass further wealth. We could argue that disproportionate wealth gives individuals too much power, too much political influence, and deprives the next generation of opportunity. Let's say we set the limit at a billion. One billion dollars, of course, is still a lot. Here is the one billion dollar mark. It is nearly five times the distance between Earth and the International Space Station. In fact, this line is so high that less than 1,000 individuals in the U.S. are above it, and these people hold a lot more wealth beyond the one billion. Let's imagine we were to redistribute the wealth above the billion dollar line, arguing that anybody who has attained such an astronomical level of wealth has not done so strictly on their own, but has relied on other workers and governmental policies to amass this wealth. So in this exercise, how should we redistribute the wealth? What if we draw a line at the bottom and define a minimum level of economic well-being that, in principle, no one falls below? We would first give to the least wealthy household, then the next least wealthy, and so on, creating, in effect, a wealth floor. How high would that wealth floor be? That is, how much would the least wealthy household have? Well, it would be about $55,000, or about 360 feet of $1 coin, just higher than the Statue of Liberty. So who would be impacted by this? Certainly the multi-billionaires, but as mentioned earlier, there are not a whole lot of them. In fact, if we place the coin stack of each billionaire in the US next to each other, they would be about the length of a private jet. Compare that to the number of households whose wealth would be raised. More than 50 million households in the US would have a higher level of wealth than they have now. That is more than a third of all households. 
If we place their coin stacks next to each other, the line of $55,000 stacks would extend all the way from New York City to Chicago. It would take 12 hours to drive past the coin stacks for everyone whose wealth has been lifted. Redistributing wealth from above a billion to the bottom third of the US population may seem utopian, but we need to remember that the current system that allows individuals to accumulate astronomical levels of wealth at the expense of others is one that we as a society have designed. That means it's also possible to imagine and design something different. Okay, and we continue for four more minutes uh, with the following. Oop, not like that. Oh, yeah, there. Okay. So, uh, arguably, this was not a real utopia, but it was certainly utopian, right? To say, what would happen if we just called it, you know, somewhere at a billion? By the way, there is a political philosopher right now, Ingrid Robbins uh, from the Netherlands, who just wrote a book about limitarianism, where she proposes just that, that political philosophy has been concerned about defining the bottom, that we should also set the top. She doesn't propose a billion, she proposes 10 million. Um, but uh, I, I, we did start, uh, again, to compute what that redistribution would look like. Now, this is a problem if you inv invite two sociologists to an economic inequality session. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't see any public economists, but of course there's a whole section of economics that does exactly that. And of course they would shake their head right now because there's a lot of other assumptions you need to make about redistribution to judge what exactly the distributional effects would be. But it's going in that direction. In fact, these models are not so uh, foreign to what we're doing here. Okay, so what can ISR do to help us engage in uh, real utopias? And here I would actually say ISR has been doing that for the whole time. I just want to frame it differently. First, uh, invest in uh, international collaboration and connections. Why? It actually turns out why you may have found this radical and illusionary that many more equal institutions that sound utopian to your ears are already real in other places. Can you imagine that there is a three-year uh, paternity and maternity leave in other countries? Isn't that crazy? How could that ever be? Um, to me, that is the beauty of comparative social research. ISR has played a major role in enabling comparative social research. The PSID has spun dozens of other national representative household panel studies that allow us to track how different institutions influence inequality. And some of them, from this perspective, may sound utopian, but they are real. Second, invest in a diverse next generation of social science scholars Sasha will also talk about this. Um, and why? Because I think that visions of more emancipatory solutions often come from the lived experience of inequality. You can only come up with these solutions if you've lived and been affected. I didn't say only, but I think it's likely that you come up with these visions of emancipation if you've lived through experiences of inequality. And also fresh ideas often come from fresh minds. Okay, so let me return for the last two minutes to the warning that my father gave me as the constant warning. Uh, I think he would say, okay, that's fine. You, yeah, you should do social science for the public interest uh, by making your knowledge accessible to educate the public and by providing a vision and analysis of a less unequal future. Now I realize that this may be controversial and may create a reaction among some. Uh, uh, and that reaction may be, is that really our job? Aren't we just objective social scientists creating data for analysis, all of this seems a little radical. And I would say, of course, this is our job because if we don't do it, others do it. Um, others provide information that's not based in empirical reality. Others shape, shape narratives. Um, so for example, the visualization that Sasha and I put together could be interpreted in a much more uh, uh, damaging way as some failure of black families to maintain the social status when we know that they face institutional racism. And others offer visions too. I would not call them visions, but if you think about the racist, white nationalist uh, replacement theory, this is a demographic theory that's made up uh, and used for political purpose. And we need to create a vision 
that's different and based in empirical reality. So what I'm saying, it's already happening and it's a direct challenge to the survival of democracy. And with that, I think it's an ISR's DNA. Uh, we've learned this morning that supporting democracy is the bedrock of the, of the ISR tradition and it's central to Jung's vision. And also we've learned in a wonderful talk mm -hmm. that ISR always has been and always will be a place for dreamers. And with that, I'm very happy to be part of that and thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna talk, I think a little bit more hodgepodge than Fabian did. Um, and I'll also warn you that I have maybe more questions for the crowd than I have answers, but I hope you'll come with me um, along this journey and think of together about what ISR might look like in the future. So as Fabian um, promised, I'm gonna start with my fan letter to the PSID. And that's part of the kind of first section of the talk that's really focused on the topic of this session, socioeconomic inequality. So the PSID among other surveys, but the PSID is particularly close to my heart has been really crucial for research on economic mobility. So the intergenerational persistence of economic position and also for research on wealth inequality, two things that I study. Um, we could give probably hundreds of examples of this kind of scholarship. I chose just two that are favorites of mine. Um, I also made sure to include an economist um, to play to the crowd here as well. Um, and not just any economist, but Gary Solon, who was a professor here at the University of Michigan. So in this kind of classic paper, he used PSID's longitudinal nature to say that the association between father's income and son's income in the US had been understated by using just single point in time measures and that by averaging across multiple years of father's income, we got rid of the attenuation bias and saw that the US was much less open intergenerationally than we had previously thought. On the right, you see Dalton Conley's Being Black Living in the Red, which also used data from the PSID, now particularly the wealth data that began to be collected in the 1980s uh, and looked at the inequality by race in wealth in the US, again, with an intergenerational lens. So Fabian already talked about the PSID, but I think it's actually stunning in retrospect that in the 1960s, a group of scholars sat down and said, we're going to start a survey that will have benefits in the cross section and in the near term, but the real payoff isn't gonna happen until an entire generation of people have you know, transmitted the, into, the, 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 into the future. So those original 1968 families, the real signature contribution of PSID couldn't be observed until their children had grown up. So it's an incredibly long range vision that I think is sort of mind boggling to think about um, being willing to, to have that delayed gratification. For me, a scholar of gender inequality as well, I also wanna give credit to the PSID, which stands out among economic oriented surveys, the CPS, SIP and so forth, for its attention to both family and unpaid labor, women's stuff, right? So the PSID has for a long time devoted substantial resources to getting the relationships in the household right, enabling family scholarship, and for decades has asked questions about time spent in housework. So not only is that just a useful thing to have, but it's also symbolically important to say that not only these economic outputs but also the unpaid labor predominantly done by women is worth measuring and worth studying. So just a few ideas for what might come out of this tradition and be next in our study of socioeconomic inequality. And because of my own interest in family and gender and wealth, I'm gonna focus there. A through line to all of this is the way that we have to change our research in the face of social change. So one way that we might want to change how we do things is that there's been a long time assumption in almost all the US surveys of wealth that wealth is shared minimally by the couple, but perhaps by the entire household. We know from data collected in Germany that when you give married couples a chance to say whether they really own everything equally, they do not so much agree with that statement. And even in the US using data from the survey of income and program participation, we can get information on the different accounts held by spouses. And again, see that couples don't tend to share that wealth equally. Now you might say, well, sure, but marital property laws, divorce, blah, 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 don't they still really share it equally? And that's a fair question, but we can't understand the kind of economic sociology of the couple without at least having the information 
to understand what couples are doing with their money. A pet peeve of mine in the voluminous scholarship on intergenerational mobility is that I think women have been a kind of afterthought. So those early studies of intergenerational mobility were very much focused on fathers and sons. And now we've gone beyond that. So we have fathers and daughters, and we have mothers and sons and mothers and daughters. And I think essentially what we have done is change our code from sex equal equal one to sex equal equal two. And that is an important first step. But I think we have to take the next step, which is to say not what happens to this model built for men if you put in women instead, but if we were to design a theoretical understanding of women's experiences of status attainment and the reproduction of inequality and status and power for women, what would that actually look like? Throw out everything we know about men, how do we have built that theoretical model with all the same care and thought that went into building, say, the Wisconsin socioeconomic attainment model. And then third, I think that um, we still have a lot of unanswered questions about different kinds of families. So because I do a lot of work about gender roles and how they relate to marriage and divorce and parenthood and so forth, every time I give a talk, someone in the audience will ask, what does this look like for same-sex couples? And I have my answer down pat. I say, well, unfortunately, it's a small share of the population, and so I can't really do a subgroup analysis. It's inadequately powered. But that's a choice, right? We have a long history of oversampling certain subgroups whose experiences we think are important to understand. GSID oversampled low-income folks. NLSY oversampled Black and Hispanic young adults. In general, we have not done that for the experiences of queer families. Lots of subgroups are important. I'm not necessarily saying that we have to pick just one, but every time we choose to let go of the fact that we just don't understand the experiences of a particular group, that is a choice we're making. So with that in mind, I wanna just spotlight research that's not happening at ISR. Um, it's the National Couples Health and Time Study. It's um, jointly run by Claire Campdush and Wendy Manning, and it will be the first adequately powered study with enough same sex as well as different sex couples to be able to explore the experiences of both. I think it's kind of a model of what we might do. And if family isn't your thing, you might think of other subgroups that we could similarly invest in understanding the experiences of. Okay, that's actually the end of anything about specifically socioeconomic uh, inequality that I'm gonna talk about. The last two pieces are gonna be a little bit more big picture but I think they have implications for how we do our work here at ISR. So Fabian already alluded to the training component of ISR. ISR is sometimes referred to as not a teaching unit. So that's both factually inaccurate, but also kind of philosophically inaccurate because of the substantial formal as well as informal mentoring that happens. One thing I think is distinctive about ISR is the share of that mentorship that happens not just to students enrolled in degree granting programs in this building, but beyond the walls of ISR to other parts of the Michigan community, and then also beyond the campus footprint of Michigan itself, or for folks that we don't necessarily think of as part of the traditional Michigan community. So there are so many examples here. I had to cut down the slides, so I would just give a couple but throughout, what I hope you'll pay attention to is the way that Michigan's strong reputation for training in the social sciences across the board, psychology, anthropology, economics, sociology, et cetera, really hinges on this complementarity between the training work that happens in ISR and that that happens in the academic disciplines. So just a couple examples, um, the kind of signature training program of ISR is of course the Michigan program in survey and data science. I believe it has over uh, 200 alumni at this point, as well as uh, almost 30 students who were enrolled in other Michigan graduate programs but earned a certificate in uh, survey methods along the way. But even for folks who never got any kind of formal recognition of the training they were getting in survey research, this sneaks in to training happening in other parts of the university. So my home discipline of sociology requires all PhD students to take a practicum beyond the kind of standard statistics and so forth courses where students have to get more detailed training in one of any number of research methods. Now the first three on this list, qualitative, comparative historical, quantitative, you can find those at basically any top sociology program. 
This last one, survey methodology, I think you can find it maybe at most one other. So this kind of opportunity for training is really distinct to Michigan and obviously could not happen without the partnership with ISR. You can see that course isn't even taught in the sociology department, but here at ISR. Let me give you one more example that goes kind of the opposite direction. That's the Population Studies Center, which has had, I believe, over 600 trainees. And again, we see a kind of interplay. I know the text is small. This is again from the uh, course requirements in sociology. One of the options for an elective is social demography. So here, this is a course that is taught in the sociology department, but it's taken by folks who are funded on the PSC training grant, which of course includes economists, as well as folks in public health. And that whole enterprise is enabled by the training grant that's held by the Population Study Center here in ISR. So these are just not separable things from one another. I, I wanna shout out the summer programs. I think uh, this was mentioned this morning. This is another thing that's kind of stunning to me that back in the 1960s, uh, somebody said, well, I think we should have this summer program um, here where we just like teach people statistical methods. And similarly for the Summer Institute in survey research techniques. For those of us who are Michigan faculty members, whenever you go give a talk someplace else, someone will say to you, ah, I once spent a very lovely summer in Ann Arbor, and this is what they mean, right? And so this scope of these training programs, over 25,000 folks who've gone through ICPSR summer program, the Summer Institute and Survey Research Techniques just celebrated its 77th anniversary, so it's even older than ISR. And these are ways that the Michigan uh, footprint just extends so far beyond our campus. And I think it's also part of the reputation building efforts of the university. Okay, so what's next? As much as we already do to do wonderful mentoring, I think it's reasonable to ask, our, ask ourselves what could make our mentoring more fully and equitably accessible. So I wanna give just two examples that I think are um, one quite minor and one a little bit harder to think about how to solve. So I'll give the easy one first. The process by which we look for GSRAs to work on our projects. Now for the faculty, if you're like me, historically, you just think to yourself, ah, what graduate students do I know? Oh, I'll ask them, right? And that's a very easy way to do business and it may even be the right choice in a given moment but it means you get boxed out from understanding what other graduate students that you may not know are out there who have perhaps a set of skills that might be perfect for your project, but you don't know about. So this is a change I had to force myself to make, even though it's a little bit more work for me to just put out a call for and say what skills I'm looking for and what experiences and then let the applications come to me. And when I have done it, I have always chosen to hire people who I didn't actually think were quote, the best graduate students, but we're the ones who were best for that project. So that's a simple change we can make in the way that we do our ordinary day-to-day -day business. The other thing I think is much harder. So get using PSC as an example, the training grant for PSC comes from NIH. NIH has a very specific mission, which is to, uh, in this training component, to train Americans. In other words, people who are US citizens or permanent residents. Now we might have no issue with NIH's mission, but it creates an equality among our graduate students. So their access to this training program that they have a high desire to be part of is contingent on the circumstances of their citizenship status. I think that's an absurd situation. It's probably not the one we're trying to create of inequality among our students. Again, I don't have the answer. I don't think it's NIH's fault. I don't think it's ISR's fault but it's a kind of inequality that I think we need new ideas to try to address. Another question that I often think about um, as someone who sits in and directs a program that's really focused on training and mentorship is what's the training that we should be doing here and what's the training that we should let other folks do? So you can think of this as kind of a general problem, like there's 85 statistics courses on regression being taught at all different parts in the university. How can we do that more efficiently? But in the specific case of ISR, we might think, where are there holes in the training of individual academic departments or disciplines that we could fill in the gaps for? Obviously, the demography training program is one example, but you might think of others, whether it be on the health sciences or data science or something else. Okay, last I wanna talk about ISR as a workplace. And I wanna start with this lovely Louis Brandeis quote. I'll let you all read to yourselves.
with I think just a small number of adjustments, <laughs> I think it fits our circumstances very well. One of the really distinctive and I think um, strong features of ISR, as was mentioned this morning also um, in Bob Grove's opening keynote, is that it's quite nimble, right? So we have a bunch of different centers and then within centers we have programs and units and they're all doing different things topically with different funding structures and different organizational structures and they can come into existence and then fade out of existence to meet the evolving needs of the science and the scholars. So that is all great. But I think it also brings up some challenges that as a workplace we have to think about. So one question I have is how can we provide, oh no, faculty and staff with a robust mentoring system, oh good, great, um, in this relatively decentralized system. So again, I direct a quite small program. And so I wonder, how can I make sure that the folks who are in that center have access to the kind of mentorship that will help them grow into being the best scholars they can be? Now here, I have a little bit more of an idea for an answer than I did previously. Advances launch committees. So some of you may already be familiar with these. The advanced program is a program that was designed to uh, sort of improve diversity and equity in the academy. And these launch committees, the idea is that if you're a brand new assistant professor, you get assigned a launch committee. That committee is comprised of the chair of your department or program, another full professor in your same department or program, a full professor in a related field, and then an additional neutral convener who tries to kind of keep things on track and make sure all the topics are covered. That group of four full professors meets with the new assistant professor once a month for their entire first year. I think it's incredible. And it already exists. All new tenure track assistant professors in engineering, LSNA, and information have this. Furthermore, the Advanced Launch Committee's program has spawned similar programs in music, theater, and dance, and the kind of consortium of health sciences that includes Michigan medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, and kinesiology. That's a lot of the university. I don't personally myself see a reason that ISR couldn't be the next name on this list. Okay, and then last, I want to close by talking a little bit more explicitly about diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So as a sociologist, I'm of the belief that it's really hard to change hearts and minds, but you can put in place organizational structures that will try to mitigate the potential damage of our own individual frailties and failings. And the good news is that as social scientists, we have a large body of research that tells us evidence-based policies that help organizations to meet their goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, the critique I'm about to make is not at all specific to ISR. I think it applies to the entire academy and to social sciences in particular. Despite this robust social science research, I think we kind of persist in acting like we don't believe it. So the question I have for all of us is, if we do believe this research, how would our on-the-ground policies need to change? And again, this is not because I think ISR has some unique deficit in this respect, but rather that I want us to be a leader and to think about if we know that one of the best practices to achieve these goals is accountability in the organization, what would that accountability look like for meeting our DEI goals through all parts of the organization? If we know that something that works is uh, having processes for hiring and review that follow a certain kind of process that mitigates bias and personal haste from entering the conversation, how can we follow those best practices? I'll leave us there. Stay mind, okay. Yes. Session, which I'll kick off with a couple of questions, one for each of them, and then I'll encourage you to please line up behind me to uh, ask questions. So I'll start first with uh, Fabian. So, Fabian, you presented a really compelling um, vision and argument that we should kind of first focus on these utopian ideals of where we want to be and then try to work backwards from there. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts kind of on how much of the balance should we put on that process versus the process of thinking about the kind of political and um, economic realities of how we would get from where we currently are to where we want to be. 
Um, and then I'll ask my question for Sasha next. Um, so you, you also mentioned, I think, very compellingly indeed, that our research needs to adapt to kind of changes in, in the workplace and the family. Um, so more specifically at ISAR, is there kind of a balance that you would put more on different uh, modes of data collection or different questions that we should be asking in our surveys versus kind of changes in the specific research context that we're focusing on? Great. Thank you. I'll start since I got the first question. Um, so I think Joe's asking for, in some ways, a theory of transformation. So describe, critique, vision, assess it, and now what? Are we stopping there? Um, my preliminary answer, because I'm also just beginning this journey, is the sequence I just described we got to do first. And I think in the past where I've seen real utopian thinking be effectful, it basically did that without any theory of transformation, I believe. So if you think about one example I often use is by a colleague in, from economics, Sandy Darity, who in the 90s started beginning computing what it would take to pay reparations to the descendants of enslaved black people in this country. As you may imagine, his colleagues uh, thought he was crazy, uh, that this is a question that, you know, why would you spend time on this? And it took uh, quite a bit of time uh, until at least uh, you know, one side of the political spectrum came knocking on his door to say, hold on, uh, we want to talk about reparations. Could you please tell us, is this 5,000, 50,000, or 500,000? We need to know. We need some numbers. So I suspect that it was probably less passive than I just described it. But he created knowledge way before it became part of the political narrative. And I think you need a long breath uh, to be there. And that, to me, ISR can provide too. This part of foundational science, to have that knowledge available when it becomes relevant. Now, can we play a role in it becoming relevant? I think you would have to be quite optimistic to think that our efforts to reshape narratives uh, immediately translates into shifting the political discourse. I don't think that's as easy. But you could also say that the kind of accessible uh, descriptions perhaps can at least contribute to you know, shaping narratives that eventually make things politically more feasible. Yeah, and to your question to me, Joe, um, I guess one thing that I think is important is having this kind of long range ability. Um, so it's, I can't imagine that when some of these programs were launching in the 40s or the 60s, they could fully see what all the implications would be in the future, but sort of taking that leap of saying this might not pay off for a while, but we're going to give it a try. I think that's a good starting place. Um, I think that, I mean, some of this is about like the organizational structure of the social sciences, also, that I think there is some, like, we like innovation, but sort of almost to a point, right? And so saying, oh, I'm not going to use the old model of stratification, I'm going to say something totally new about what works for women. I think that we also can play a role as reviewers, as gatekeepers in this discipline of encouraging that kind of innovative and, and maybe um, novel kind of thinking. I think I have to turn this on. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, someone came up and switched it, I thought. Right. Okay. So as an emeritus ISR research professor, uh, I was fascinated, Fabian, by um, your proposal and obviously your illustration here. Um, but I'm reminded that back in the late 60s and the early and mid 70s, we um, basically in sort of an on off thing, um, various of our leaders went out and hired people who were journalists and who would come and spend some period of time here, months, a uh, year, to take the research that we had completed, but we weren't interested in carrying to the New York Times and yes, I think you're right, we would want to control the, the message and so forth. And that was very exciting, but it was never a, something that could really hold on. So I think I look back on that and I think the people who are doing research here are by and large not on the side of the thing which says, I want to create change beyond collecting, designing and collecting good data. So I want your thoughts on what does that mean we have to have different kind of researchers that we hire? Um, because when you think of sort of our, our research funding, um, very few organizations I know from our time uh, searching for money in Washington were interested in having us take a political stance on something as clearly you would have to with your particular um, notion there. 
one related question. Very excited with your illustration. Um, but when I think of media, I talked about people writing articles for us or books for us, not doing something like that. And they, the problem is not just creating the kind of things you're creating, but also you have to figure out distribution in ways that aren't handled by libraries and Amazon books. Um, so what, what does that mean for how we think about communicating what we're doing? Perfect, great, thank you. Great questions, I'll give a very brief answer because it basically comes down to the one concrete proposal I had is ISR needs to hire a data journalist. Um, perhaps there's an, I mean, who knows whether this is gonna work, but um, I think we need translators and I think that there's a whole field of data journalism that we didn't have 10 years ago. But my hypothesis is we want a data journalist in-house. Whenever I show these illustrations, colleagues come up and say, oh, this is so cool. I, wanna, I have this paper, I'd love to illustrate it that way. How do I do this? And I'd love to tell them, oh, go up to the communications department. There's this amazing person uh, who sets it up for you. Perhaps it can work like that. The other thing is acknowledging a failure, and my, the communicator of CID will hopefully forgive me, uh, that um, you know the, this video is a smashing success with 4,000 clicks, <laughs> uh, totally viral in our new world. Um, Right, it turns out that distributing video is a different kind of animal. Journalists don't like this. Um, perhaps we should have hired, uh, you know, probably within uh, uh, 100 yards here, there are three influencers that have 150,000 followers. Perhaps we should have had not a, a journalist in residence, but an influencer in residence. Um, I think there are new models we can think about. So I think this is a call for the great creativity of our communications department that already exists to, to think about these questions. Um, those were great presentations. I just wanna get into some kind of substantive issues a bit on wealth inequality, because you've both done such great work and you've probably both thought about this issue. So one of the reactions I had, uh, Fabian, watching your, your cool uh, infographic is, as a, speaking as, as another emeritus faculty member, over my life, I've traveled a lot of that uh, diagram that you're showing. So, and, and a lot of people have. So I'm throwing out the issue of age and life cycle issues and wealth. So many of us start out at zero and then we go negative, sometimes very negative. Then we come back, hopefully we get a little bit positive. Um, you know, none of us get up to, the space station, um, <laughs> but um, a, a big component of, of wealth inequality is age life cycle inequality. And I guess I'm throwing out like, do you have any idea how much? So if some if a critic said, well, you know, a lot of what you're showing us is just you know young people versus old people. Do you have any like how much of it is that? Is it sort of a drop in the bucket, or is it something big? And do you have a way to sort of factor that in? Mm -hmm. In some ways, Sasha can respond to that in a second too, because this is based on another paper we wrote where we try to break things a little bit into age buckets. But I'll take, so you can, if you want to sort of do the response based on our research that we've done, I'll just allude to the fact that right, we often lack power to look at uh, smaller groups. And I'll point towards a future at ISR that's already in the making uh, with Pablo Mitnick, for example, as co-director of the Wealth and Mobility Study where we're now assessing exactly this question, wealth mobility from the entire United States based on individual level tax records. So Pablo and his team have access to the full population of tax records in the United States, creating wealth measures for everyone, everyone in the room and, and the other 350 million. And we will, for the first time, have the power to look at exactly that questions by age, you know, by other population uh, parameters, I think, as much contribution as the PSID has made to these questions, the sheer sample size is not allowing us to get into these heterogeneities. For example, for the first time in history, we'll be able to look at differences in wealth across this country, right? We don't even have information, not even in the SCF, about wealth levels, wealth inequality, or wealth mobility for states. We don't even know that. So that's a study that's currently ongoing, led by Pablo Mitnick, uh, I'm helping out with a large team uh, within CID. Um, it's sort of the, so the response is, yes, we're trying to get there. 
goes beyond the PSID uh, using text data. Yeah, I see that your question kind of points to like a very unresolved conceptual theoretical issue involved in inequality, which is, okay, suppose that all of the inequality and wealth were by hand. Would that be fine? Right? I don't know. Um, and so- Well, that's actually part of the question. Yes, that's what yeah. I figured. So, yeah. and I guess I don't know, but I think that these are the kinds of questions um, that just haven't been tackled as much in wealth inequality scholarship because it is a younger field. And so from some perspective, you might say, well, you know, permanent income, blah, blah, blah. It's like fine if everyone goes through the same pathway as long as their lifetime exposure to wealth. On the other hand, you might say, well, the kids who have older parents will then have wealthier parents who are able to expose them to better kinds of neighborhoods and environments. And so that's not okay. And so I think, yeah, there just is this question of how do we want to, what wealth inequality do we care about or not? And how do we measure that? I may have said this before, but it's something that kind of keeps me up at night is if you save for decades to, to send your kids to college and then you write the check to send them to college, are you really that much worse off the next day? In some sense, you achieve the consumption, but it's just not in your bank account anymore. And these also these questions about like how should we normalize for household size? I think that is a real place where as a field of social scientists, we need to move past just, oh, wealth matters to think, Okay, well, do all forms of wealth matter equally? Is it how fungible it is? Is it something else? Okay. Um, this is a little bit of a different kind of question. Um, you were talking about reparations, which an idea that seems to me not to have gotten a whole lot of traction in this country. But this is not the only country that has built its wealth on exploiting its minority populations. And I was wondering what you know about the experience of other countries. Has it been tried anywhere? How did it go? Or is everybody kind of where we are going kind of nowhere? Should I go first? Uh, it's a, it's a question that's close to my heart and that's where the international comparison comes in and certain for, for me, a very personal one too. Um, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but uh, I've for a long time claimed that thanks to Americans, uh, Germany has developed an approach to dealing with its history that's in some ways healthy because it acknowledges historical guilt. This is where the conversation starts uh, in relation to the Holocaust. There is no debate about our historical guilt and the responsibility that arises from it. I don't think that the US is at that stage. Um, and I've long said that is actually a model, again, sponsored in 45 by, by the US in re-educating the German people, that that's where we need to begin our conversation. So there are models that I think in general, without making the direct comparison between the Holocaust and any other atrocity, but still models that acknowledge historical guilt and responsibility that arises from it. Now, uh, you know, that was sort of a clean story. In this case, sort of a, a good one about a German model that may work. Uh, Germany had colonies and innovated you know, modern genocides uh, in Namibia, for example. Uh, not once did I hear about that in high school. Um, there has been barely any discussion of reparations being paid to the descendants of Herero. Uh, in fact, the conversations we have similar to in South America is the kind of reparations that need to be paid to white farmers who've been disappropriated after you know, some of these structures were abolished. In the same way that you know, Haitians have paid reparations to French people uh, for many years. Um, so there seems to be something particularly anti-Black in our um, dealing with history. So I'm not quite sure that you know we have the models, and that I think makes the kind of anti-racist efforts at at this university all the more important. So there are models. There seems to be particular anti-Black racism when it comes to the debate about reparations, and I don't think I have not seen the successful um, proposals. I'm one more emerita here. <laughs> and I wanted to just have comments. Uh, you might want to ask a question. One is, uh, Fabian, I think I, I have like five siblings and uh, 14 nieces and nephews, and they all have progeny who are now in their teens. And I'm always trying to explain what it is I do, used to do and what I should do. I think this stuff is amazing. 
I'm going to take it home and make the, the next family reunion. I'm <laughs> going to make them sit through it because the way of seeing the distribution of stuff, you know, and, and I mean, I've been writing this shit my whole life, you know, is I just think it's a wonderful tool and I really like it. And, I want to ask you later if you have more of it, because I'm going to bore my relatives for hours on end. <laughs> and uh, Sasha, the stuff about mentoring, the way in which you're thinking about it, is like way forward. You're moving forward in a way that didn't exist when I was running programs. And I'm really, first of all, I'm proud of you, but uh, mm -hmm. I was her thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, her, she and my son were in the same math counts team in junior high. But <laughs> <laughs> so I've been watching her a long time. But the way in which you're thinking about it is so cool. I thought, and I just wanted, so these are my comments. I don't have anything to ask you because I, I, you're way thinking beyond where I was, but I found this very exciting. Thank you. Mary, I just, I mean, yeah. on the mentorship point, I mean, I think Mary, along with several others, has a huge amount of experience in mentorship, and I certainly benefited from that. And one of my hopes for mentorship is that we have to rely less on extraordinary people going above and beyond the call of duty and saying, no, this is the call of duty. We actually have to do a lot of mentorship as part of the job. And so uh, Mary's been a wonderful example. One of my hopes is that we can sort of pay it forward in a more organized, institutionalized and equitable way, I would add, because if you listen closely to Bob Grove's uh, comments, mentorship and the hundreds of students mentored only came up once he started talking about the women in the ISR. <laughs> the women in ISR were <laughs> I was fascinated by um, hearing about uh, your recommendation on data visualization. I want to share that ISR actually has a long history in data visualization, not always, I'll, I'll say, um, advanced. Uh, one side trip here, uh, the father of uh, data visualization is generally attributed to be Ed Tufte at Yale. He actually taught in the ICPSR summer program one year. He was not teaching data visualization. He was teaching uh, regression at, at that, that point in time. But I'll also mention that he took an exception to a published article published by uh, uh, a few ISR people. I'll, they'll go nameless at this point in time. But he pointed it out as an example of what you shouldn't do in data visualization. Why? Because they use the computer to create it. Now that was 40 years ago, uh, but I'd be fascinated to what he would think of what you were doing with visualization, doing something that could only be done on a, on a computer. Uh, I, I'll say, I'm, I think that's great, but be careful. Uh, there were arrows and to pioneers. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Dushani. I'm a research assistant professor. And I want to thank you both for the great talks. I love seeing you two together. It was such a complimentary and um, exciting conversation. Um, and so I'm going to ask a, a bit of a big, big question, in part because I'm a research assistant professor and I'm learning. And I feel like you both have really innovated so much, both in terms of mentorship and the model of CAD, but also in your own research. So my question is kind of riffing off of what Sasha said about what keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you both about what is maybe the one thing from both of you that kind of keeps you up at night. And if you had an international space station budget and beyond, what would you do about it? So that could be in the realm of mentorship or it could be income inequality, however you want to answer that. Thank you. Whether Fabian's going to meet our deadline. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no. Um, I really do think the equity stuff is what keeps me up the most at night. I think um, I think some people, their legacy will be the scholarship that they leave behind. 
I don't have that um, vision for myself as a scholar. But I think the way that we make the lives better of the people who are around us is something that lives on. Um, and so I think thinking about how we can um, improve our, ourselves and improve the mentorship that we do, improve the organizations and society that we're part of. Um, in part, I think it keeps me up at night because it's not what we, oh, it, it's not what we, oh, interesting. Um, it's not what we go to grad school for. So we don't exactly know how to do it. Um, and so it's something um, that I think I feel a lot of uh, uncertainty about what is the right way to institute organizational change in some of these bureaucratic processes. It's not something that I have a handle on the way I think I know how to write data in my conception. Yeah, very interesting question. And I also love being here with Sasha because I think we do have quite similar and also in some ways complementary views. And just listening to your great comments, I probably, similar things keep us up. I, I uh, like Robert, uh, Bob Grove's comments that he has a, he finds people who build organizations to be important and cool. And I think we're trying that. Um, and building equitable in, uh, organizations is tough. Um, I think it takes lots of trial and error. And I think you're, you're doing it too. And we've talked about that a few times. And as Sasha said, we don't have training to do that. So I think we have the one benefit that we didn't study biochemistry and are trying to run an equitable lab. We studied stuff that's immediately relevant to this. So I think we're in a good position to also provide innovative organizational structures. So, you know, Sasha is doing that on a daily basis at CID. Uh, I'm building a new organization in Munich where, you know, we're also asking ourselves, how do we make this equitable? I'll just give you one example. I think, you know, the idea is always great, but it com push comes to shove mostly when it's about money. Uh, so, for example, one thing I'll continue to do is uh, participatory budgeting. Uh, there's no reason why a unit leader needs to unilaterally decide on how budget is allocated. Uh, that can be a community effort or participatory democratic effort. Cities do that. They turn over part of the city budget to a democratic process. There are so many more democratic processes that we can pursue. We have a wonderful philosopher here on campus, uh, Liz Anderson, uh, a MacArthur Genius Grant uh, winner who wrote a book on, can you believe how crazy the uh, modern company is? How inegalitarian and undemocratic? We would not tolerate that kind of tyranny in any other life sphere. Uh, the fact how we run companies is incredibly harmful and undemocratic. I think there's so many, I mean, you see that I sort of have real utopia all, always on my mind. There are so many other models, but it's, it's tough. It's sort of, it doesn't always work, and, and, but we're going to try. Hi, I just had a comment that I really loved your artistic art visualization with all the colors and people rising and falling. And, you know, it was a wonderful thing, really. Um, and it really does show how digital skills and artistic uh, knowledge can help us. Um, I was wondering to myself whether the PSID might be a data source with which one could maybe test that old saying, I looked it up on my phone, uh, that said that from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, because I wondered these people were rising and falling in one generation, and I'm wondering what would happen. Yeah, Tom, Tom and Esther, we have to wait a little bit longer than mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, yeah. any day now. We'll know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Although we did have a bit. I know, but they're young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, yeah. But but I will say this. So, for example, there, we, yes, they're still young. But in our paper, we had a three generation on the analysis, and the racial inequity in this three generational context is even more yeah. mind blowing. Um, um, so, just gives all the papers twice as good. The um, home ownership rates of black children who come from home owning grandparents, right? So black children come from home owning grandparents. Their home ownership rate today is lower than the home ownership rates of white uh, grandchildren from non owning uh, white grandparents, right? So over three generations, then entirely flipped. Um, so we got to wait a little more. Um, but I do think that we have evidence that these multi-generational mobility processes have the same, if not an even more extreme form of uh, racial inequity in them too. Yeah, and we got to continue the PSID to know. 
Okay, so uh, my comment is is intended to be friendly, but it's going to be a little critical okay. of how you frame what you showed us. Um, sorry, is that better? Yeah. Um, I'll summarize. I'm supposed to be friendly, but critical. <laughs> okay. But a horse. Um, friendly, but a horse. I'll just, I'll just give you some honest feedback as a political scientist. The word utopia makes me nervous. Um, and I, I realized what you were doing was kind of a hypothetical exercise about, top, you know, cut it at a billion, redirect, all that. Um, and I know it wasn't meant as a policy recommendation. Um, but I do think that we should be evidence-based, okay? And um, the evidence of governments that target specific populations like that and that talk in terms of utopia have, don't have a good track record. Um, and that if we go down to like realism, like what should we take from what you showed us policy-wise, perhaps a wealth tax seems like within the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and what I take mostly from what you showed us is when people claim things like how can we possibly afford to pay for public goods that let's say certain people in the population think should happen, um, you know, free community college education, free education, something like this, um, that there's, there's plenty of money, plenty of money out in that stratosphere, right? And with more sensible tax policies, we can achieve those goals. So I just wanted to say, as a political scientist, when you start talking, in a, when you use words like utopia, when you use just the visions that I get in my head, make me very nervous. I'll just say that. Well, that's great. Yeah. Perfect. No, I, I would have been a little uh, disappointed if no political scientist would have stood up and said, well, <laughs> I'm not so sure. So I'll try and answer a very brief answer in sort of three uh, moments. One is the dominance of the status quo. I think what seems utopian now and makes you feel uncomfortable as utopian uh, can change at any time. A lot of things we've implemented sounded entirely utopian. When we implemented the income tax, it's a huge debate. Um, was actually its legality or constitutionality was discussed at length, whether we could tax income in this country. Uh, it seemed unthinkable before, that changed. Um, I could have presented today perhaps some simulation of what it would take to cancel student debt. If I had presented that 10 years, he would have said, well, that's utopian. Uh, that's a policy discussion right now. And you know much more than I do about how that becomes, how that travels from outside of the scope of political debate to inside of the scope. But the only thing I know, it changes. So I, so I call that the dominance of the status quo. Things sound utopian that really are not. You know, I can also turn it around, not to be the US. The, uh, you know, I moved back to a country where we separate students after fourth grade because we think we know where they should go. You know. Some should go to university, some should become laborers. Uh, I mean, how crazy is that? No German thinks that's crazy. That's just efficient how to do that, okay? Uh, it's an example of the status quo just dominating what we consider utopian or not. So I would challenge you know, that feeling of discomfort uh, as what may be utopian today may not be utopian tomorrow. And I have more questions, but a lot of, I don't wanna take up too much space. I, uh, more, more thoughts on that. Um, you are right, I'll say the last thing, it's not a policy recommendation, but I do think it makes a significant difference whether we start with this or a debate about whether the top uh, tax rate could be adjusted by a percent or two. It's just the narrative entries into these discussions determine how we think about them, right? We don't do wealth taxation in this country, starting at confiscatory wealth taxation, as suggested here, is different from saying, could we tax the returns on capital income instead of taxing it by, with 15% at the same level that we tax income. Uh, so I think there is narrative entry to me is an important point. And last thing I'll say, the fact that we do this is slightly different, I think, and I hope I'm not overestimating our role as intellectuals, 
uh, is slightly different from other people doing that. I think the, the probability of someone say, I mean, people will say the Pfeffer guy is clearly crazy, you know, European so socialists. Uh, but the status we have in society gives us a particular responsibility or perhaps privilege to suggest ideas that are, may sound utopian, that are not immediately uh, marked as crazy. How's my mic now? So terrible. Oh, no. it's fine. No, it's fine. Yeah. No. And I'll get feedback if I do this. I should just yell. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, I think just one sort of maybe way to bridge these two perspectives is um, when the 2020 uh, Democratic primary was happening, which seems like a very long time ago, um, that in that moment, there was a lot of discussion about student debt. And if we were to cancel student debt, what would happen to the race gap in wealth? And the person they called to provide the answer is just like a professor who doesn't particularly study, who doesn't particularly study the consequences of policy decisions. And I'm not sure if there was a better person to call. And so one way that we might kind of get between these two things is to say, well, how can we be ready when that phone rings? Right, and so in that case, it was they were not asking for an evaluation of a policy that had already been implemented. We do tons of program evaluations in the social sciences, but they were asking a pretty complicated counterfactual question of what would happen if we were to cancel the student debt. And I actually think that the the data to understand like which you know student debt from whom and for whom was going to be canceled was like not available to the public to be able to answer the question. So I maybe that's the way yeah. to think. What are the kinds of policies that we hope will get a call for? And how can we make sure that we have an excellent answer? I, maybe a model here is like population projections. The modern group has been doing population projections for forever. They can't say it's going to be exactly like this, but the UN produces like the upper bound, the lower bound, the middle bound. Maybe that's a place that we can acknowledge with humility or uncertainty while still providing information. <laughs> you know, my colleague Kate wants to ask a question too, so I'll go really quick. I just have an announcement. So oh, okay. Um, I'm also a political scientist. My name is Chris Ferris, um, and I share my colleagues' concerns. Um, and I study human rights, so I, I definitely want good progress on that, that dimension. But I have a conceptual question. Um, so there's a discussion of economic inequality, I think in terms of uh, the generation of wealth, like uh, as an outcome, like wealth as an outcome to processes that individuals structured by institutions and social settings and all that stuff achieve. But then there's a separate discussion, I think, of equity of access, not just to institutions like ISR, um, but to the financial resources that may or may not be necessary to generating some outcome that the individual is interested in, which may or may not be inclusive of wealth. And so I think my question is about the link between the two types of inequality. And that's something that I didn't hear discussed too much detail uh, in today's presentations. Thanks. Or a paper, so yeah. <laughs> so in the paper that's behind this visualization, we estimate the intergenerational correlation of wealth and ask how is wealth transmitted from parents to children? And the economics literature has chiefly focused for good reasons on inheritances. This is sort of the unique feature of wealth, right? You just pass it on. Uh, you just hand it over, much harder to do with education, occupations, and so on. Uh, so there was a big focus on the role of inheritance in you know, in these processes. What we show in our paper is that there are many uh, more indirect and early life processes with, through which wealth gets transmitted. So for example, the relationship between parents' wealth and their children's educational outcomes, such as college attainment, which by the way, that relationship has strengthened in the United States rapidly and is really large. So there's wealth inequality, family wealth inequality, and educational attainment. And educational attainment is one great channel to accumulate wealth. So there's sort of this descriptively mediating story of a lot of the wealth, intergenerational wealth correlation, about half, uh, going through processes like in inequity in education, access to housing, access to business, and access to marriage. Um, that these intergenerational, or that these mediators account for a large chunk, namely more than half of the intergenerational wealth transmission. I hope that brings together those two concerns that you asked, if I didn't misunderstand. Great, um, thanks to you all for great questions, and let's give another round of applause. Okay, I do have a brief announcement. Uh, 
Fabian motivated me to share this, but I just wanted to make sure you were all aware that Jim and Wendy House um, generously have provided a gift to Wallace House, um, and it's a joint effort between Wallace House and ISR where, where um, a journalist will come in, and I don't know if you're all familiar with Wallace House, Mike Wallace, 60 Minutes. There might be a little generational moment in here, but I still really embrace 60 Minutes. Um, but journalists from all over the globe come in for one year to be fully embedded in a disciplinary area that's of interest in their journalistic work. And so next year we will host in part, a, we, we will be partnering in our hosting of a journalist who will focus on data science and data visualization. And so it's not quite what the utopia you had in mind in terms of embedding a journalist here, but maybe it could lead to such an effort. And I also wanted to make certain that I shared that on October 23rd, um, Lydia Polgreen, uh, Lena Salinas, and um, Brett, Stevens from the New York Times will be in conversation with Vince Hutchins about the election. That's going to be 6 to 8 p.m. at, um, at um, let me just get you where the <laughs> at is. Um, it's Rackham. That's right. God, thank you very much. Yeah, so Rackham 6 to 8. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us there, but I felt it was in spirit of what you were suggesting. And we hope that this gift will lead to lots of exchange between journalists and social scientists. Can you so, the date again? October 23rd, 6 to 8 at Rackham. Great, thank you. Thank you.